In today's video, I'm going to show you how to create a simple to-do list app using the Deoxys framework. And during the course of this video, you learn how to construct UI elements and manage state. And so hopefully by the end of the video, you'll have a good understanding on how to get started using the Deoxys framework. If you haven't installed the Deoxys framework yet, just head over to deoxyslabs.com and they have a pretty good guide on how to get started. And don't forget to check out the iOS and Android guides if you want to develop for mobile platforms. If you're having um, trouble with the setup, just leave me a comment and I'll try my best to um, help. So assuming for a moment that you have everything set up, let's go ahead and create our to-do list app. So to create a Deoxys app, we need to use the DX command and we can do this in one of two ways. We can do DX init to initialize a new project within the current directory, or we can do DX new and give it a app name. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead with DX new app. And then Deoxys is asking us which type of sub template should we expand. So for this, I'm going to select bare bones because I want to keep this guide simple. And then Deoxys is going to ask us a series of questions. I'm going to go ahead and select the default for all of these. So for Deoxys full stack, I'll select false. For Deoxys router, I'll select false. And for Tailwind CSS, I'll also select false. And then finally, which type of platform do we want to serve as default? This is going to be a desktop application, so I'm going to select desktop. And now our app is created. Let's go ahead and open it up. So this is the contents of our bare bones app. And you can see that we have a main.rs file and an assets folder that contains a main.css file for the main styling of the app. So if we go back to main.rs, if you're familiar with React or Flutter, you'll notice that Dioxys takes a similar approach where an application is essentially comprised of components. So looking at the main method, you can see that Dioxys is launching an app, which is essentially a Rust function that's annotated with the component macro and um, components return an element. But unlike Flutter, Dioxys just uses regular HTML to describe the UI. So you can see further down, here, the access in the hero component is just using divs and images to describe or declare the UI. So let's go ahead and run this sample um, project to see what the UI looks like. To run the app, we just type in DX serve, and this will compile and run our app using the default platform. So in our case, we selected um, desktop, so we should get a desktop uh, UI appear soon. So this is our desktop application. It's quite simple. It's just a, it's just a boilerplate code. Let's go ahead and change this now and start writing our to-do list app. So I'm going to start by renaming the hero component to main, and then we'll change the inner contents of the root div to create a new layout with a header that will contain an input field where we can type in our to-do list item, and then we'll have a new div adjacent to this div that will contain our to-do list items. Now notice I'm putting the class above the input and that's because attributes need to appear before any sort of content for an element. So if I wanted to add other attributes, they'll all have to appear before the content of the div. In main.css, I'm just going to remove all of this code and add some, some code that I've already written. Now I'm not going to bother showing you this code. It's really ugly CSS and it's just not worth um, going over it. Okay, so let's compile it and see what our new UI looks like. So once again, DX serve to compile and launch our app. And this is what our app currently looks like. So we have a text field that we're going to use to enter our to-do list item. And the goal is to show our to-do list item just underneath. So let's go back to Rust. And before we go any further, let's just address the RSX macro. So this macro allows you to essentially write JSX style markup and it is what actually returns the element. In fact, it actually returns a result that contains a node and also a render error. We can also use if statements and loops and other raw expressions within the RSX and I'll demonstrate this by writing a simple loop that's going to simply render a few items. So what I've done here is created a loop that's going to iterate um, four times and it's going to display a to-do list item. And that item is made up of a label and a button. And you'll see later on in the video how we can code that button so that we can delete an item. For now, let's go ahead and run the app just to see what it looks like. So here's our list of items generated by the for loop. You can see we have a delete button and an iteration count 
that's been used as a placeholder to display the item name. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start writing the code to capture the input data and to do that we're going to look at how to manage component states. To manage state in components we need to use hooks and a hook is just a Rust function that takes a closure and initializes a value and that value can be a primitive type such as an integer or a complex type such as a vector. And there are many built-in hooks that we can use to manage state. The simplest hook to use is the use signal hook. And the way that the use signal hook works is that when the value contained within the hook is updated, then the hook simply notifies the component to re-render itself. So again, if you're familiar with React or Flutter, the concept of managing state within a component should be familiar to you. So let's go ahead and create our first state. And we're going to use this state to store the data that's coming in from the input field. So we need to do two things. First, set up the state and then use the input fields on input event to capture the data and store it into the state. Now the on input event is going to give us the input value on every key press, but it's not going to give us a key code and we need a key code to determine if the enter button was pressed. Because only when the enter button is pressed do we know that a to-do list item has been entered. Okay, so let's just have a quick recap. We're using the on input event to get the input value on every key press, but that doesn't give us a key code. So we're then using the on key down event to get a key code. And using that key code, we can determine if the enter button was pressed. And if it was, then we can do something with the value. For now, we can just print it to the terminal just to make sure that it's all working. So let's go ahead and recompile our app. And so what we're expecting to see here is that when I type in a to-do list item, so I'll just type in milk, we'll assume that it's a shopping list. And you can see that it's printed milk to the terminal. So that's great. So all we need to do now is just to push that item into a vector and then we can iterate over that vector and show our to-do list items. So I'm going to create a state called items and items is going to contain a vector of strings so that we can push our to-do list items into this vector. Now before we continue compiling the code let's just take a moment to address the right method on the items vector. Now vectors don't have a right method so where is this right method coming from? Well if you notice that our states are actually a signal and it's the signal that has the right method. So when we call items.write, we're returning a mutatable reference to the vector and on that mutatable reference we can then call push. In a future video, I'll go over hooks in more detail, but for now, let's just go ahead and print the vector of items to the terminal so that we know that the vector is collecting the items. So I'm going to enter a few items, and every time I press the enter key, we should see the vector being printed to the terminal. Okay, great. So that works as expected. So the only thing that we need to do now is to show our to-do list items in our app, and we can do that by modifying the for loop that we created earlier. So if we scroll to the bottom, we can just change this for loop to loop over the to-do list items. And now when I enter a to-do list item, we should see that item appear in our app. So let's type a few more items just to make sure it's working. Okay, so we now have a semi-working to-do list app with this ugly delete button that does nothing, but we'll get that to work shortly. But first, I want to add SQLite support to our project so that we can save our to-do list items into a database. So now that we have SQLite installed, let's go ahead and create a database to store our to-do list items. And I'm going to create the database within the main function because we only need to create the database once. So once we create it in the main function, we can then go ahead and delete it once our database has been created. So once the database is created, we just need to create a new table in that database. So in this case, I'm creating a table called app with two columns, an ID and a name. And the ID is going to be sequential, so we'll be able to use it later to delete an item. Right, so by running our app, this is going to create our database and our table. And once that's done, we can go ahead and delete the code. So now we have a database and we need to create a connection to that database and store that connection into a state because we want to access that connection from several closures. And the first closure that we're going to create is the add item closure. And this closure is going to take an item and insert it into the database. And then we'll use that closure in our on key down event. So a lot of code just flashed before your eyes. So let me take a moment to explain what I've done. I've created a closure to take a string and insert that string into the app table. And then I'm simply calling the um, closure in the onKeyDown event. So when we enter an item, that item is going to get saved into our app table. 
So now that we're able to save um, an item into the table, we need a way to retrieve those items when the component is loaded. And so to do that, we just have to simply query the uh, app table and retrieve our items. So I want to pause here for a moment just to explain this error message. So basically, Rust is telling us that we've created a temporary value that's going to get uh, dropped while it's borrowed. And so to fix this error, all we have to do is give the value a longer scope, and we can do this by using the let keyword. So this fixes the error and we can now move on to query the prepared statement. And I'm going to do that by using the query map function, which takes a closure and returns a row. Now we have two columns in our table and we want to map those two columns to a data structure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new type called item and we're going to give it an ID field of U32 and a name field of type string. I'm also going to derive debug on this struct so that if we need to print it later, we can do so. So now all we have to do is return an item for each of the row in our app table, and we can do so by mapping the row data to each field in the item struct. Now the query map function will return a mapped rows, and we can use these rows to iterate over the items and add the items to the to-do list vector. But the vector currently takes a string, so we'll need to change it to take an item type instead. And finally, we just need to change the code here at the bottom because the item variable is no longer a string, it's an item type. So we're just gonna call dot name on it and we need to clone the name field because we can't move the value out. So let's go ahead and run the app now and see where we currently are. So I'm going to enter a few items and you should see the item appear in the list below. So remember that we're no longer pushing to a vector, we're saving directly to the database. And the way that this is working is that we have a dependency on the connection state. So when the connection state is modified, the component is re-rendered. And so here, the connection state is being modified every time we add a new item to the database. Now take a look at the terminal and you can see that we're receiving a warning. And if you take a look at the app, you'll also notice that the milk item is duplicating. So there are two issues that we need to fix and they are not related to each other. So let's go ahead and see how we can solve these. So the first issue we have is trying to update a component state whilst that component is still running. Now, if you think about it, that kind of makes sense because we're trying to add an item to the database, which is managed by the state, and then immediately trying to retrieve those items and update the UI. So to solve this, we can use the use effect hook, and this hook takes a closure. So all we have to do is move this part of the code into the closure, and that should fix the warning problem. So let's compile and run again just to make sure that the warning message has gone away. So first you can see that we already have two items in our to-do list app and that's because we entered them previously. So these two items are coming straight from the database. Now if I add an item, you can see that the warning message has gone, but the items are still being duplicated and this is an entirely different problem. So what's happening here is that when I add an item, the component is being re-rendered. And when that happens, we query the database again to get all the to-do list items and put them back on the vector. So to fix this issue, all we have to do is clear the vector just before we add the items back on again. Now the approach I've taken here isn't the most efficient. So in another video, what I'll do is I'll show you how to restructure the code so that we don't have any of these kind of issues. Okay, so our app is almost complete. We're just missing the delete button. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy this closure and I've just realized that I've spelled that wrong. So let's go ahead and correct it. And I'll also need to correct it here as well. Now the delete item closure isn't going to take a string, so rather it's going to take an item. And by taking an item, we have an item ID, which we can then use to delete the to-do list item from the database. And now we just have to add an onclick event to the delete button and then call the delete item closure. So notice that I'm calling clone, and the reason why I'm calling clone is because we can't move the item out of the iterator. But we still have a problem and that's because we're cloning with inside the closure and that's not going to work. So what we have to do is clone the item outside of the closure, something like this. But you can see that we have a syntax error here. Now, unfortunately, within the JSX syntax, we're not going to be able to do that. But thankfully, there's a way to solve this. So what we can do is create a new component and move our list view item into this component. And by doing this, we now have an opportunity to clone the item before we move it into the onclick event. 
So I'm going to move this code into a new component. And remember that a component is just a Rust function that returns an element. And components can also accept arguments. So in this case, we're going to accept a single argument, which is the item that we're going to get from the iterator. But for this to work, we're going to have to derive partial EQ on the item struct. And now we can use our new component, just like a regular HTML element, and pass it any arguments it takes. So there's just one last thing that we need to do. If you look at line 99, you'll notice that the delete item is no longer in scope. And that's because it's been defined in the main component. So what we can do in this situation is to pass the delete item closure as a callback argument to the item element. Now, normally when you pass a closure or a function as an argument, you would expect to IMPL one of the FN traits, but that's not going to work in this case. So we have to use Deoxys' callback type and give it any type arguments that it needs. So with this fix, our delete button should now work and we can recompile our app and test it. So I'm going to delete a couple of items from the list. So bread and egg should now be deleted. And if we relaunch our app, we should see that those items no longer appear. Okay, so we've just completed a simple to-do list app using the Deoxys framework. I'll do a few more videos on Deoxys, so if something didn't make sense in this video, hopefully it'll make sense in one of the other videos.